Good evening. I would like to welcome you all to this online academy discourse this evening, which is supported by the law firm Mason, Hayes and Curran, LLP. For those of you who are not familiar with academy discourses, they are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. The first discourses were presented in 1786. Historically, academy discourses were the occasion reserved for the most distinguished academics to first reveal and discuss their work in public. We hold six discourses each year. In the past few years, we have had Nobel Prize winners, as well as internationally distinguished political figures, senior European public servants, and internationally eminent scholars. And they've delivered a broad range of discourses most of which are available on the Academy website. I'm Dr. Mary Canning, I'm President of the Royal Irish Academy. Also present here this evening is the Academy Secretary, Professor Mary O'Dowd, and the Academy Treasurer, Professor Patrick Conahan, who is one of our distinguished speakers this evening. Also in attendance online is our Executive Director, Dr. Tony Gaynor. And uh, before we begin, we have some short academy business to undertake. The minutes of our last discourse panel discussion, entitled, Who Were They? Conversations Between Genetics and Archaeology. And that took place on the 15th of December, 2021, and it, the minutes were posted online. Since our members did not inform us of any issues with these minutes, I will take these as approved and I will sign the minute book of the Academy House, of the Academy minutes after the meeting. Our speakers for tonight's discourse conversation are Professor Patrick Conahan and Professor Francis Ruan, who are both members of the Royal Irish Academy. Patrick Conahan was Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland and a member of the Governing Council of the European Central Bank from September 2009 to November 2015. He is an honorary professor of economics in Trinity College, Dublin, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Previously, he spent 12 years on the staff of the World Bank in Washington, where he was a senior advisor on financial sector policy. During the 1990s, he was a research professor in Ireland's Economic and Social Research Institute. In the 1980s, he was economics advisor to Professor to Tisha Garrett Fitzgerald. A graduate of University College Dublin, Patrick Honahan received his PhD in economics from the London School of Economics in 1978. His most recent book, Currency, Credit and Crisis provides an account of the Euro area and Irish banking crisis. He was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2002. Francis Rouen is a graduate of University College Dublin and the University of Oxford, where she was awarded a DPhil in 1980. She was a member of the Economics Department of Trinity College Dublin from 1977 to 2006, when she moved to take up the role of Director of the Economic and Social Research Institute. She served in that role until July 2015. Her research interests are mainly in econ international economics and business dynamics. Professor Ruan is currently Chair of Ireland's National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, and she has previously served on various Irish public bodies, including the National Board for Science and Technology, the IDA, the HEA, and the HRB. Her international roles have included serving on the Council of Economic Advisors of Scotland from 2007 to 2018, and the European Statistical Governance Advisory Board 2018-2020. She has been an honorary fellow at TCD since 2010, and she was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2003. Following our conversation this evening, 
we will have the opportunity for some questions from you, our online audience. And if you wish, wish to ask a question, please use the Zoom question and answer function, and we hope to have time to answer as many as we can. So now to this conversation, Patrick and Francis, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, President, for that introduction. Uh, and you're all very welcome online to this, this discourse. Um, Patrick and I were asked by the Academy in May of last year if we would do a discourse on current economic issues. And uh, we decided this would be something which would be suitable for Academy members, but also a wider audience, since we thought it would probably still be online. Uh, so we decided to wait until later on in the summer to see what would be the current economic issues. And as all of you know, in the period since then, there's been an enormous change. So these issues were, were evolving over the period of the last nine months. So we, after several outdoor meetings, since that was all that was possible with COVID, we decided on three topics, uh, which we're going to uh, concentrate on this evening. And they're really reflective of current issues uh, and also of the unusual times that we're in. And a key theme running through, as the president mentioned, is the link that Patrick has both with the, uh, the Irish Central Bank, but also with the Council, uh, Government Council of the European Central Bank. So the first topic that we're going to, to, to dwell on is central banks, inflation and interest rates. And we're going to start with inflation, uh, which is now seen as a very much a global issue, but was very much a minor issue really last, 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 last May relative to what it is at the moment. Uh, then we're going to take a historic as well as, as, as a current context for that and then move on to talk about interest rates, which of course are a key policy issue and, and a strong link with the, with the real economy. So the second topic we're going to talk about then is extremely current, which is central banks and geo, current geopolitical issues. And of course here we're talking about uh, what is a very recent event in terms of its, 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 its public focus, and that's the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so a key conduit for, for Europe's dependency, for the, for the link, if you like, with the global economy is Europe's dependency on Russian oil and gas and the role that the revenues from these play in actually facilitating and supporting Russia's uh, continued invasion of, of, of Ukraine. And the third topic then is going to be on banking and digital currencies and climate policy, the notion that banking and, and central banking is getting an interest in these areas, which um, is really very much evolved over the last number of years and is likely to evolve very much in the future. Um, big issue being whether or not central banks should, should, should effectively see that the cost of finance reflects the negative externalities associated with climate damaging investments. So Patrick has prepared some really good slides, so we're going to have a different stages of uh, switch over into the slides, um, and they have to give a sort of perspective on some of the issues that we're talking about, particularly the long, the long series of changes over time. Um, so before we move into conversation, just as the, as the President mentioned, there will be a possibility of doing Q&A uh, during the course of this, and we're hoping to pick that up on our, our, um, uh, our iPads here in front of us as we, as we go through. Um, so given that so many people are on, on, on uh, Zoom, we're going to focus on trying to finish in and around seven o'clock because we know how long, long a day can be at the end of, a long Zoom call can be at the end of the day. So that's my by way of introduction. So I want to now start uh, with questions for Patrick. So let's start on the question of inflation. Um, for people of your and my generation, Patrick and I go back to the same economics class in 1971. Um, inflation dominated well over a decade of our lives. And then in the recent past, we've had a couple of decades of actually um, relatively low rates of inflation. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe Patrick, we start by getting a picture of that difference over that period, because people are now talking and talking about the fact is, are we heading into a period like it was back in the 70s? So maybe you'd like to open up on that on that issue. Or even go back a little further. So um, yeah. if we look at the first slide uh, that I, I just prepared, it's an easy one, which um, oops, so shows us the price level, not the rate of inflation, but the price level in Ireland uh, over the years since 1914. Uh, it is in a log scale. So that means that it doesn't just zoom up in, in, in a way that it's hard to detect, but the slope of the line indicates the rate of inflation. You see two periods of rapid inflation, one at the very beginning, 1914 to 19, and one then in the 1970s. Uh, let's look at the next slide, because I've labeled them. Yeah, so you can see World War, no, no, back. no, back. Yeah, um, World War I, and then the oil and stagflation era. 
And if you look very closely at the very top, I have a little, two little dots that show us the projections for 22 and, and 23. So overall, what we see is that there's been an upward trend generally through you know, uh, the life of the state, but not always. There was a longish period of uh, falling prices in the 1920s and, and 30s as the UK, which determined our rate of inflation through the currency link, tried to get back on the gold standard at the old exchange rate and then the global depression. And then the other period of interest is the great acceleration, the two oil price rises, mm -hmm. the policy response to the oil price rises. And there was an extensive debate in Ireland, if you remember, yeah. in the 1970s about um, whether our inflation was homegrown right. or whether it was imported. That's right, and I think there was a lot of pressure to say that we could solve this ourselves. We could solve this ourselves. It wasn't something that was linked to our role in the, in the global economy. But we, uh, we had a, a fixed peg, one for one peg, right. with the pound sterling. And sooner or later, whatever happened in Britain was going yeah. to happen here. Yeah. That didn't mean that local policies were very relevant um, because you could become very uncompetitive mm -hmm. if you pitched your prices yeah. uh, and, and then you'd have to roll, roll them back for a while. Um, there was a particularly rapid increase in... Uh, uh, through 79 and beyond 79, mm -hmm. inflation still kept going That's because right. we had disconnected from sterling and mm -hmm. there was a kind of momentum to our own inflation. We were in the, in the European monetary system with the pegged but adjustable exchange rate and we kept on adjusting <laughs> to, to, to deal with our, our excessive inflation. But that had the value of escaping from the Thatcherite austerity to some extent by virtue of having yeah. our independent currency with the adjustable. And I think that might be interesting to look back to do is the fact that the, the sort of trigger for the inflation in the, in, in the 70s uh, was an energy piece, which I think is why people are connecting exactly. the energy origins of the crisis now with the energy origins back down. But of course, it became something much, much bigger than that as it became embedded. That's right, because it, the, ener the oil price rises of, of uh, 73, 4, and then again, it's the second mm -hmm. round in 79. Uh, th that was a relative price change that was coming from somewhere outside our yeah. system. Basically, it, couldn't it, was be. it was basically OPEC, basically. It was Restricting OPEC. supply and, and world prices went up, and there we were. And, yeah. and, uh, and these relative prices couldn't be entirely reversed, but every segment of society tried yeah. to insulate itself That's by right. pitching wages higher, prices higher. That's and right. that led to a general increase in prices, great increase in uncertainty about where relative prices were going to be, and even accelerating as people tried to put, build in a cushion, not just to pay for or to compensate them for the price rises that had happened so far, but yeah. in anticipation of further price rises. And that disrupted profitability of firms, led to a recession, stagflation, it was called. Yeah, Ominous echoes of that era. Hmm? Yes, and, uh, yeah, and a, a massive loss in our competitiveness in terms of what we were trying to do as an exporting economy, having gone into Europe we suddenly had found ourselves in a very difficult position in the, in, in the 80s. By, especially by, by maintaining the, um, uh, the momentum of the, of the earlier inflation and going the, on. And then there was basically the notion that we were, we, were, we were building an expected inflation into wage negotiations. So this thing got on to a, that was more into the, a, a the mid-80s, wasn't it? It was really um, spiraled. He, slow down in the early 80s. Slow down the early 80s. Got rid of the inflation in the early 80s. And of course, it wasn't really us that, that eliminated inflation. It, the, the real signal to eliminating inflation was the actions of Paul Volcker in the United States, That's who right. said, yeah, when we'll, we'll, maybe we'll come back to that when we, we talk yeah. a little bit about, about, about interest rates. Um, I want to look at the next slide, though, because I want to bring us a little bit more up to date, because in 1999, of course, we were back in a, in a regime where we didn't have our own exchange rate. Mm -hmm. We had the euro. And this, this part of the chart, which is just, a, if you like, a detail of the earlier part, although it's, it's not in the um, logarithmic form, but it's not necessary because inflation is so low in that period. Um, you see a, an interesting two halves to our experience since 1999. You have the first half of that experience, right up to 2008, where the prices grow along a line which is more or less the same as 2% inflation, mm -hmm. which was the target. Well, the target was below, but close to 2%. Yeah. And since then, and people have probably forgotten this, people keep on talking about inflation in, in the in 2015, 16, 17, they said, I don't like inflation, but actually there was no inflation. Mm -hmm. Prices were, they fell for a while and then they were stable. 
they were stable right up until, until 2019. If prices had continued at 2%, yes. look where they would have been. They'd be on the blue line. They'd be on the blue line. Yeah. And then you see the last two years, um, the last two years, 22 and 23, which haven't happened yet, but I have put in the ESRI mm -hmm. forecasts of inflation in 22 and 23. That's the central bank today published its own forecasts, which are more or less the same for 22 mm -hmm. and um, lower for, for 23. Well, how long will the current inflation continue? Could it become like the 1970s again? Will the ECB stop it? Can the ECB stop it? And again, the initial shock, the initial cause of this inflation is mm -hmm. a series of price increases somewhere else. Yeah not just energy prices, supply chain problems uh, related to pandemic. Um, monetary policy is designed to ensure that inflation comes back to the 2%. So that's right. the only thing they're really asked to do, the central bank. So that, from the point of view of your, of your chart, is, is, is a parallel line to the back 2%. Back to the parallel, parallel line. Whereas at the moment, we're more vertical. And uh, will they achieve that? Mm -hmm. Financial markets actually think that they mm -hmm. will. Yeah. And that's a bit of a surprise, because if you talk to the general public, and indeed mm -hmm. many economist colleagues think, oh, well, this is trouble again, we're yeah. going to have a spiral. But financial markets think that inflation will come down. For example, <coughs> um, if you take the financial market's expectation of inflation in 2026, mm -hmm. that is 1.9% in the euro area. If you wanted to buy protection against inflation, you would pay 2.3%. Uh, so you're paying the expected and you're paying mm -hmm. a risk premium. But the uh, market's expectation of inflation, in, they expect a lot of inflation between now and then. Yeah. But by the time you get to 20, 2026, And does that amount 2%. to believing that the, that the Council of the ECB will make sure that that happens? Is, is it exactly. a belief in the system responding to whatever is going to happen? Well, and that, taking the that, relevant that, actions? That, that seems to be, the yeah. markets don't always believe what the, that the ECB <laughs> will, will do what, what, it's, um, well, in this case, what, what it do. intends to do. But uh, so far, they do seem to. Yeah. So that may be a little bit of a surprise. And it depends not only on whether some of the external shocks, mm -hmm. like the Russian hydrocarbons, the mm -hmm. supply chain, mm -hmm. are removed, um, but also whether, it, it, um, whether this spiral can be removed. Because right. that long period of low inflation was, was helped by the favorable price shocks, the lowering of prices coming in. Every time China, Chinese companies started to produce something at a lower price, that was a so that was the globalization effect. That was globalization the benefits effect. to the Irish cost base and cost base around the world of, of cheap resources from, from the newly emerging economies and China being a huge part of that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that to some extent is going into reverse as well as we, um, as we see um, well, the whole, whole issue of globalization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being put into question. Let's move on to the next um, slide there because <coughs> they're... they're um, just, this just looks at the inflation rates instead of the mm -hmm. price and gives you homes in on those periods, those very high periods of inflation in the, in the, middle. the, in the middle of the 1970s, the, rabbit's the two rabbit's ears. Rabbit's ears. And, and you get almost the same pattern in yeah. British inflation in those years. And you see the fall, the negative inflation 2008 9 mm -hmm. and, and the rise now, and the slight fall projected by the SRI. And if you continued that, it would be a, a further fall. One of the things that's happening at the moment is that most governments, many governments in, in Europe, have started to use subsidies yeah. and income supports to compensate for the sharp rise in prices in order to head off the threat of spiraling. I mean, they say it's yeah. to be nice to people, but the reason, the real reason is that they're afraid if they don't do this, yeah. That, it, they, that this uh, psychology of I must be compensated for, will, so will take over and create this uncertainty and disruption that, that will uh, feed back on, on uh, economic activity, so, employment and so forth. So is that a sense in which they're trying to avoid the phenomenon of what happened in the, in the, in the late 70s uh, into exa the 80s? Exactly so. Building that into the system, which, which we really didn't get fully sorted out until social partnership. When we, that was the point at which we... Well, social partnership both, in my view, bo so both uh, helped generate this spire, and point. then when the social partners the realized, well, wait a minute, actually, this is not working. Yeah. So I think social partnership was, was there, was, was a, a complicit in the problem and complicit in the, in the solution. solution. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. So but the, the question is whether these, the, these um, policy measures by government mm -hmm. uh, are better targeted right. um, on the low paid and so on, are general, for example, 
lowering excise taxes on hydrocarbons and so right. on. Um, right. uh, my view is that if you reduce carbon taxes, you're undermining the decarbonisation agenda, you're missing this opportunity to take the, the positive about this, right. that, it, that it's uh, making it easy for governments to live with a higher relative price of energy, which we're going to be stuck with anyway. So in a, in a way, the support's focused on the people who are suffering most is less interfering in that exactly. process. So I would, so it's a better, I would think it's they'd be, they'd be aiming at, at, at income support rather than, uh, mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. changing the relative mm -hmm. prices. If that doesn't work, mm -hmm. if government compensation doesn't work to dam dampen wage demands, then the central banks like the ECB mm -hmm. are likely to increase interest rates more aggressively to choke yeah. off demand. Yeah. And that's what the Federal Reserve Chairman Volcker did in the United States in 1979. Mm -hmm. And yes, he got eliminated inflation, but boy, did he produce a significant recession. Yeah. And so that, that's the problem. If, 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 you can't manage the, if you can't manage any other way of reducing the spiral, interest rates are going to go up to mm -hmm. choke, because that's what the, the mandate of the ECB is. So there's a sense in which the, the tricky balance now is between managing to control the inflation without triggering a bigger recession. Yeah. then is required to kind of make the adjustment, to avoid a recession as best exactly. you can, to minimise that. So maybe that should bring us to the, to the issue of looking at interest rates, um, which of course are the key instrument that, that, that um, um, Bachler would have used in terms, of, of, terms of, of, of making that change. And of course economists, when we come to look at, 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 at the um, interest rate, we're very conscious of it. That is the real interest rate that matters, is the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. So obviously uh, the two of them, are, the two of them are, 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 are connected when you look at the nominal rates of both. So we're kind of aware that the, the interest rates have been exceptionally low in the past and, and, and in the recent past and the question is what's going to happen now in terms of the real interest rates. So what people see most of the time are the nominal interest rates and that's what the response is by, by most people who don't think it through uh, and, and would be covered in the media but the real interest rate is what really matters from the point of view of the real economy. Yeah I mean t today there's been an, an increase overnight in, in interest rates around the world and today the 10-year, the yield mm -hmm. on 10-year Irish government bonds has reached 1.3%, which is the highest rate for seven years. Yeah. Um, um, but that's not the real interest rate, that is the nominal interest, uh, nominal yield. Uh, and, and let's look at a slide that shows something, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, well, this, this version and the next version is even more, more but this one we look at for a, for a moment. Um, th this give you, gives you an indication of how real Irish government bond yields moved mm -hmm. in the period since 2005. And there are two uh, extraordinary spikes and another downward spike. And what's going on in the, those spikes? Obviously you're going to say it's something to do with the crisis. Yes it is. No, no, go back. This mm -hmm. it is something to do with the crisis, but what is it? The first spike, which is around 2007, 8, 9, it isn't because nominal interest rates have risen, it's because inflation fell. You saw the negative in inflation, the, the price falling, mm -hmm. uh, and so you get a very high realized real return on, on, on uh, government bonds, if you bought government bonds in, in 2007. No, nobody was worrying about default risk on Irish government bonds at that mm -hmm. point. Very soon they did begin to, and the second spike is nothing to do with inflation, because inflation was very low, no. Yeah. Um, but it's everything to do with credit risk on the, on the Irish uh, government. So that was, that, was, that was when our, our interest rates absolutely zoomed up. So this is, this is Ireland and this is why, yes, yeah. Irish, Irish In nominal prices. interest rates yeah. and prices, prices. Not, not moving at all. So those, those two spikes. Um, and, um, and, then, and, and, and the last one going down mm -hmm. is because inflation is soaring. And the, right. the interest and rates have gone up a little bit, but they haven't gone up anything like enough to compensate for so the inflation. So if you take the inflation rate from the nominal rate, you're into negative territory, which is why you're below the line. Exactly. Let's look at the next slide. This takes us back. This is the one I like best of all. It takes us back to, to 83 because it shows you... Um, it's a pity these slides now are not being projected on PowerPoint, but they're being projected on some other sort of ersatz software, which isn't, <laughs> isn't capturing what you're meant to be seeing, but uh, it's a pity. Um, but I, I think I can talk my way through it. Um, the, uh, there, are, there are three interesting periods here. If you start in, start in 83, you run to about 02. The spikes are high. They're very, very spiky and they're very high. 
And then there's another a lower level from 03 <laughs> to 99. The first period is the period in which we're in the, the uh, adjustable peg right. regime of the exchange rate mechanism of the European monetary system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the markets expected uh, uh, Irish government to devalue even more often than it did. Right. And the result was very high interest rates, an average of uh, around 7% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. real right interest rate. Yeah. Very, very high. Terrible yeah. exchange rate regime for us. Really disastrous. Yeah. And then it collapsed. This re the regime collapsed not because of Ireland, but it collapsed. It, it said it's continued. It didn't really continue. Um, and we had a more or less a floating exchange rate um, for the rest of the 1990s. And the actual in interest, the real, real interest, interest rates were right much now. lower. But the big effect was when we joined the euro, and you can see from 99, the mm -hmm. real interest rates are uh, low, they're negative for quite a lot. And then you see the two spikes that we saw a minute ago. Yeah. And I want to show you something interesting thing. Next slide, please. Interesting thing about the, the next, this one here, the second slide, the red line has a spike in it, mm -hmm. and the blue line doesn't. So what's the difference? The blue line is the interbank rate. The which red is what, line which is is what you've bond. used to capture the interest rate throughout up to now. So you've now put in the... No, it's a government bond I've been yeah. using up, uh, up to oh, now. Yes, that's true. And, but the government bond has the spike, which I told which was about the mm -hmm. default risk. Right. But the bank, interbank interest rates don't have that. Why? Why not? Because the, we were in the euro area. The banks have access to the ECB, to the central bank financing, yeah. and we made uh, very sure that the banks and therefore their customers and access to these lower interest rates. But the government, because of the separation between the government and central government bank, it doesn't have access to, to those, and it has spike. Well, it didn't really have to pay because it never borrowed in that period. It said, no, okay. this is not a good idea, and so they got money but from the IMF the, for much less. Yes. But, but that's the but interest that's rate it, yeah. on those bonds if right. you, if you okay. bought them. If it had to do that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, anyway, um, th th that I thought was a little bit, a little bit interesting. But... Um, now, where do, where do we take that? Uh, I wanted to, then we, we uh, the question we were asking was, will, will the ECB raise yeah. interest rates right. so and, what, and so yeah. on and so forth? Yeah. So clearly the market believes that the interest, that it's going to sort, it's going to sort things out, but it, that, would, it, that would mean possible use of the interest rate. Exactly. Yeah, well, the Federal Reserve, the US Federal Reserve has already started, already started mm -hmm. increasing its interest rate and it, it's most, um, most dovish uh, mm -hmm. member of its, of its uh, decision-making committee uh, said yesterday at a speech that um, yes, there'll be more interest rate increases, which, yeah. which is why the long-term interest rate rose yes, overnight and spilt over into our government mm -hmm. bond deals. Bank of England have already increased. Um, and uh, Bank of England has done that. Mm -hmm. ECB, well, the ECB has been struggling with too low inflation. For a decade. Yeah, which is very clear from that chart you had earlier on where the red line went up on the other. Yeah. <laughs> the Especially low in Ireland, but, but low in, 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 all, in all the other countries as well, as well yeah. because yeah, it didn't the same it. exchange rate. And was that, was that, in your view, was that because the fact that the price level was getting the benefits of the globalization right throughout Europe so that you had well, a downward, you had less price uh, inflation kind of to, if you like, oil the process than you would have expected? Yes, that, that was a, a, an important part of it, but the other part of it was uh, the Euro area recession, low demand, so that, that was yeah. weakening the whole yeah. price uh, environment. Um, it's uh, ECB is so it's 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 being patient this time. It's not it's, it's some people are fearful that actually ECB may return to a very low inflation environment mm -hmm. after these shocks are over. It's also conscious of uh, the negative effect of the war on European mm -hmm. economic activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also conscious of high indebtedness right around the euro area. Mm -hmm. So, so far, it's been slow. But interest rates are, pro are on the rise. But the question is, is, it, is this an epochal reversal? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. is it just a regression to a long-term downward yeah. trend? So could we look at another slide there? This takes away from Ireland and, and looks at, um, and looks at you know, all the major economies. And it runs back to 1980. And what you see there is real interest rates are falling, 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 right since the early 1980s, systematically falling until the most yeah. uh, r recent period. And I, this is one of the reasons I'm inclined to think that if, the, if this is a turning point, it's only a small turning point. And the way to think about it is that 
what monetary policy does, this is not due to monetary policy, this is due to demography, this is due to the rise of the Far East, this is the, due, Real due factors, to all basically. sorts of long-term um, secular factors. Uh, monetary policy achieves small, uh, temporary, let me say, modifications mm -hmm. around this long-term trend. It, it pushes interest rates either above or below the natural or long-term equilibrium rate, depending on whether they want to stimulate or re remove demand from the economy. Mm -hmm. and, and at present, um, I, I mean, we, we have had a, a long period of stimulus, and that has brought the European rates even lower than the mm -hmm. long-term trend, but when they come back, it'll still be on this okay. downward trend would, would be my, my guess mm -hmm. uh, of how things will, will evolve. Okay, so maybe we should finish up on interest rates at this point, given yeah, where, I could where talk we are. I think we could. I think we could problem? actually do it for the whole evening if we, if we, if we, if we, if we wanted to. Um, and I think it would be important to move on. But I suppose, I mean, I suppose one of the, the, the key things that does seem to be changing a little bit is that, that consciousness at the moment about how when monetary policy isn't operating, that notion of the fiscal policy coming in. So that, 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 that dialogue mm. and that discourse seems to be very much the two running in tandem yeah. in the way it's being discussed by, by the ECB. I, I think that's right. I, I mean, and, and I think that a consequence of that is that there's, there's going to be additional pressure on the public finances. There has already been pr additional pressure on the public finances from the pandemic, um, from the refugees, mm -hmm. um, from uh, the, the uh, change, the carbon decarbonization. And this uh, pressure additional spending by government, additional borrowing by government will create an upward pressure on the natural rate of interest. So okay. if, even if the monetary policy only just up around the natural rate of interest, the, the government spending, if it increases, will, will slow this fall in the natural mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. Now, Ireland isn't big enough to, to affect that, um, but it's going to be part of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these low interest rates, then, they have provided headroom for this spending. Yeah. Yeah. But the spending will re reduce the, the headroom. Yeah. But still, it, uh, since interest rates are so much lower than they were before, it has made things affordable in, through borrowing that, that, that weren't there. And you've had that dialogue going on all the time that you know, we can't afford to borrow because interest rates are low. We can, yeah. we can do this, we can do that. Which, of course, during the financial crisis, we weren't, we weren't let do, as it were. Yeah. Uh, but we, we can do it at this well, stage. It's not that we weren't let to. We couldn't. We couldn't do. We couldn't nobody do. would lend money would to us. Just <laughs> say, yes, <laughs> you saw the spike. You, nobody would Let's borrow do. at those Let's rates do. of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were let. They we were, were allowed, but we would be crazy to. They lent us more money in order to allow us to, do, to spend far more than we other, yeah, otherwise, otherwise would have. Otherwise would have been able to buy the markets. Um, and and, yeah, and, and we, we restore the credibility of the state. And that's the only thing that they need to worry about is don't lose that credibility because if you, if you move out of that range and, and cause people to worry about your, your credit worthiness, as indeed happens in some other European countries yeah. now, it's much more of a threat for them. But that's that's obviously the, the balancing act that yeah. that yeah, the yeah. minister for finance will have to. So um, you have a chart on the, uh, looking at that, that interest rate cost thing, which I think is interesting. Um, the, the debt burden of the of the. Um, uh, oh, I nearly forgot to. Yeah, to, I think that's because that, that, I, I think it's a really interesting chart for Irish people to see. Let's see the next rate. chart yeah. there. Yeah. Yes. So this this gives you an indication of this runs from 1984 when we had a, an, an earlier fiscal crisis mm -hmm. un until the latest data. And the red line is debt. Um, debt as a percent of GNI star, the, yeah. the, the, our version of GDP. And the blue line is interest bill of the government as a percentage of its tax revenue. And you can see in the 1980s, both numbers are very high. The, the red one, which, which is red off the right-hand side, around over 100%, and, and the blue one, about 30 percent. 30 percent of tax revenue was be, was going to pay, pay for interest costs in yeah. those days. So in the, in the top year, a third of tax revenue was already going to pay debt without you spending a penny on anything. Exactly. Which was which which was which was really when the economy was very very strapped at that stage. And, and, and then in in in, uh, in 2008, of course, the crisis mm -hmm. and the borrowing went even higher as a percentage yeah. of GNI star. Yeah. And um, way up to the 150, 160 percent. Yeah. But and and interest spending went up as well, but nothing like as much. Yeah. And it was a, a manageable amount, and now it has come right down. So even though our, our debt as a share of, of GNI star is in the same sort of territory as it was in the 1980s, because interest rates are so much lower, interest yeah. burden isn't, isn't a really a material part of it.
Yeah, so that's just so, the, so that's where the sense of the, the, the low interest rate comes into play in terms of the burden and the constraint on government in terms of, of, of public expenditure. I want to sort of one last picture on interest rates, and it's a, it's a bit blurry, but when it comes up, but I think I think it shows you, I think it shows you something about this global, this general secular trend in interest rates. A mere You'll see 700, it downward. 700 years. There's 700 years rates. there. It, 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 the chart goes back to 1310. I couldn't get a better version of it. And there are little arrows showing uh, the lending from the Ahmadis to, to Singh Sig Sigismund of, of, of um, I guess he was from Hungary, or if, if Hungary existed that in the 13th century, yeah. and all sorts of military and political events. Um, government's very much involved. Uh, it's not about central banks when it comes yeah. to interest rates. It's yeah. about government's, government's borrowing and it's about secular trends in saving and investment. Mm -hmm. So that's, no, it was just, it just, it just, but it does give you that story going back even further, that downward, that downward, it, downward trend. Downward trend, yeah. I come back to that at, to that at the end. Well, look, let's move on to our second topic, which you've already mentioned a couple of times in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I guess how the, the global economy responds to that and what's been happening with the sanctions and basically um, how how basically they've impacted on the on the the um, on the ruble, and basically I suppose the that notion of how sanctions interact over a period of time with what happens to the economy afterwards. So there have been some yeah. examples of that before. I mean, obviously for most of us in this generation, this is the really big one that we're seeing at the moment. Yeah, I suppose it's it's big, especially because Russia is big, um, and, and the most dramatic and unexpected mm -hmm. sanction. That, that was brought is really in this monetary sphere that we're, we're talking yeah. about today. And it's the, the, the freezing of the assets of the central yeah. bank of Russia, the Bank of Russia. Um, uh, could we have a look at the slide that shows the reserves of the Bank of, of, of Russia? No, the previous one, that one. Now this goes from 2012 until, until you know, a couple of days mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it starts around 500 billion US dollars. So they had plenty of reserves in 2012 and 2013 and 20. And then in 2014, they went to war. There's the first, I, I call it the first Russo-Ukraine war. But I don't know whether it's really the first, but anyway, it's the first of this century. It started. <laughs> this first century. <laughs> and they used up a lot of their reserves. It went down to 350 in, in that period. And then after that, uh, when that, there was a Minsk settlement and yeah. things quietened down for a while. And for the following, Seven, six or seven years, uh, they were building uh, what looks like it, they were building a war chest again, mm -hmm. right up to 640, um, 640 billion. Now the funny thing is about the way this has appeared, on the, there is a, da a drop at the end of that slide, or for whatever reason, the, it's not appearing on the screen in front of me, but there is a drop in the last, in the last three weeks of that slide because they've started to use, use the they started to use uh, the reserves again. This um, so sanctioning... Patrick, with, that, with that decision to build up the war chest as you've described there, that would have been a decision to do that rather than spending money on other things. It was a deliberate, you reckon, yeah. deliberate yes, war chest yes. decision. Well, I don't know why they built yeah. it up. They didn't say we're, they we're planning but a it war. But wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, were they, was, was there oil and gas exports expanding? Was their it oil and gas exports are far in excess of their imports. That's true. Yeah. They could import more, and then they wouldn't have accumulated yeah, many, many reserves. Yeah. So it was, it was a decision to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but the sanctioning of them, which uh, now they can't use any of those reserves that, are, that reside in a Western bank. Right. Uh, or, 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 uh, they, they can't use, so they can't use a lot of, 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 of the, their reserves. And it, it's, it, this use of monetary power to achieve political or, or military ends. And it's not the first, not, mm -hmm. by, not by a long shot. Uh, and I'll immediately go back to Suez in 1956. Okay. Um, the British government um, persuaded the French and the Israelis to invade, um, persuaded the yes. Israelis to invade Basically. Suez and then went in with their own military forces mm -hmm. to pretend to, to def defend Egypt, but basically to seize the Suez Canal, right. which had been nationalized a few, a few months before. Um, this was not considered very appropriate by the United Nations or indeed the United States. It's the United States is the relevant. It wasn't really thought very highly of by the financial markets either. So there was a run on sterling. And the trigger by it. Trigger by it. And mm -hmm. the uh, parity, which was 2.8 to the dollar, was under threat. And they were, their reserves were falling, falling, falling. Mm -hmm. And they s decided, the British decided, they would have to go to the IMF. And they realized they better check with the United States. Would the United States vote for them? And the United States yes. said, no. Okay. They said, no, uh, you've got to pull your troops out. 
Wow. And until they pulled their troops out, uh, until they announced they were pulling their troops out, they couldn't get a loan from the, from the IMF. So this okay. kind of financial uh, use for military purposes. But there's another example, which is more complex to interpret in those, those ways, but it's the same, same sort of game going on. And it's to do with the Czech gold. In 1939, um, 1939, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Um, and they s arrived at the Czechoslovak National Bank and they said, you've got some gold, where's the gold? And the Czech, Czech said, um, it's actually, we, we entrust this to the Bank for International Settlements, which is the Central Bank's bank. Uh, bank. It was set up to manage German reparations after World War I, but it soon became the Central Bankers Bank. So we said, well, we, the gold is, the BIS looks after that for us. And so the Germans said, tell the BIS to, um, to give, the, give us the gold. And to cut a long story short, mm -hmm. uh, the BIS complied with the mm -hmm. Reichsbank's wishes. The gold was in London, in the vaults okay. of the Bank of England. And the Bank of England staff said to their boss, um, I think what's going on here is that the Germans are getting the Czech gold. Is that <laughs> all right? And they said, yes, it's all right. Just do it. 1939. Well, there was a furor and um, the BIS has been apologizing for it ever since. Um, but again, it was the same sort of, it was the use of, 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 uh, of power. The, the of the financial assets being. But it, it was, why did the Bank of England acquiesce in this? Why did they not mm -hmm. say, we're likely to be fight, uh, fighting yeah, the Germans the same, in, yeah. in, 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 in a short while? And I think what's, well, this, is, this is quite interesting to interpret what's happening now. I think the Bank of England said, wars come and go, politicians come and go, but we're going to be dealing with the German financial establishment mm -hmm. indefinitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that idea that the payments and monetary system is something that floats above politics and floats above war, that the global payment system is a, a global public good that right. should be preserved, even if there are little wars going on, uh, has influenced thinking. And that's what's made it so surprising that in this case, today, yeah. politics has trumped, has trumped those, uh, those kinds of, banking, yeah. of, of arguments. Yeah. Um, so you asked about that. So yes, but you asked about sanctions and what, what the consequences of the sanctions are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the sanctions have been used in other places as well, Venezuela, Cuba, Myanmar, mm -hmm. Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. In Afghanistan, mm -hmm. they, the Americans hold the gold of the Afghan Central Bank. Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 we don't really think the Taliban should have that. So, right. so this happens a, a lot. It matters a lot to Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan um, not to be, have access to, to, to that, that cash. It probably doesn't matter as much as the sanctioners expected in the case of Russia. Because the bank, first of all, because the Bank of Russia is not completely shut out, mm -hmm. um, they diversified their holdings. Mm -hmm. Maybe we look at that slide. Yeah. Where do they hold their holdings? And, um, yeah. and you can see there uh, the currency composition. They hold quite a lot in gold. Well, it's not sanctioned, but mm -hmm. maybe hard to get rid you know. of. Euros, sanctioned. Dollars, sanctioned. Yuan, uh, Chinese yuan, not sanctioned. Mm -hmm. They're not part of it pounds sterling, other ones. And, and it, there actually might be more that's not sanctioned, because if we look at the credit rating, um, there's AAA, AA, A. A. A is quite a low rating for somebody to hold their reserves in. Why would they hold so much? Maybe well over th a third of their, their reserves mm -hmm. in an A-rated country. China is an A-rated country. So probably quite a lot of these reserves, uh, I think probably. estimates up to about a, almost a half may be still uh, available and to, where to the, the gold, Russians. The gold would be the gold. I don't know where the gold is, is, but I suspect yeah. it's in it's in, in Russia. It's I, in Russia I, I suspect yeah, yeah. it's in Russia. So it's not very easy to use gold uh, quickly. Well, it would become very obvious if you were. Yes, off the gold somebody has to buy it. Yeah, so that's that's not. And in, in, in 1939, it wasn't just that they transferred the label from yeah. Czech. To, the the Germans exactly. sold the gold. They actually sold it on the market, and it was taken out of the Bank of yeah. England's yeah, uh, vault. Yeah. So uh, we have a kind of. Um, we have a lot of money and financing war is is, is becoming quite quite uh, a, a, yeah. a, a topical issue. So we have some we have some Russian connection with with Ireland and through the IFSC. Is that is there is there anything there that that's, that's worth commenting on this? On this yes, session? that, I, that I, I can't claim to uh, be a, a, a particularly mm. knowledgeable about, mm -hmm. but we do know a number of things uh, about um, uh, the role of, of 
Russian entities mm -hmm. in what used to be called the IFSC. I could mm -hmm. still call it the IFSC, but everybody knows what, what, mm -hmm. what we're talking about. Um, could, could we have a look at that, that chart? There's a one chart on the, on the IFSC. Yeah. And this shows you uh, Russian entities, the, 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 the um, total assets of special purpose entities, a particular type of financial yeah. institution. It's not a financial institution that's regulated by law, but it, it's an entity that exists in Ireland. Um, you see, the data goes back to 2016, over 50 billion dollars, is it euros or dollars, it's, it's euros, worth of, yeah. of assets. Some decline, but still very high right up to the latest data, which is the last quarter of, of 2021. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Well, I, of course, Ireland has established a very favorable, extremely favorable tax environment for institutions to locate here and do, do mm -hmm. their business. I think that's, that's probably the, the principal uh, element that's, mm -hmm. that's going on here. But I think we also know that some of the prominent IFSC entities are close to the edge of the sanctions. They may not be sanctioned entities, okay. but this is something that needs to be scrutinized all the time because some of them may be very close, and, and this is something that, that the authorities here no doubt will be looking at very closely. And the authorities here closely. get to decide whether they're sanctioned? I mean, where do, where well, the sanctions are agreed, but they have to decide, you know, are you, you know, oh, who, who are you exactly? Yeah. Are, you, are you the entity that's sanctioned? Uh, you weren't exactly listed, but are you... Are you so, close so closely related that, that you need to. Yeah. But also, we also need to be aware of the, the role of secrecy in this. I, I don't think these big institutions that have 10 and 50 billion euros, they're not secret. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a certain uh, advantage of secrecy as well in locating your activities through an Irish entity. And I think there's a very interesting, um, as Derek Scally reported in, in the Irish mm -hmm. Times, uh, increasing use of the Irish limited partnership structure. Right. Firms that didn't want to reveal where they were mostly went to the British Virgin Islands. And then some of them found it convenient to go to Scotland with the okay. limited Scottish limited partnership. Mm -hmm. Now it's not so easy to be secretive about the Scottish limited partnership, so the Irish limited partnership is favoured. Right. So I think here's a, again an area where this, this tax advantage regime has uh, attracted entities that maybe we don't want to have to be doing business and we should be closing loopholes that and create sure un undue amounts of secrecy yeah. Yeah. and so forth. Is there, is there just, just, just sort of finishing up on that, I mean, is it, is it a, what's, one thing that strikes one here is that, that it, there's, there's obviously sanctions are put that there and it's the threat of more sanctions that you're hoping will change behaviour, that that's the income that the people are very often hoping to get to that stage. Sometimes you go in to do too little and then they're not taken very seriously. Obviously, they're being escalated all the time. But the other part here, and I was wondering, did this happen as this happened before, is where companies themselves have decided, as it were, to uh, disengage from Russia. And do you think that that's yeah. a long-term real effect on the global economy? Yeah, I, I, I think, I'm sure it is. Um, I think this idea of progressive uh, sanctions and do a little bit and see if that stops them, do a little mm -hmm. bit more, and see if that is, um, is poorly thought out on this occasion because, mm -hmm. in fact, one of the main things that's not been sanctioned is the flow of uh, payment for gas. Gas, yeah. And, Bank of Russia doesn't need any of these reserves as long as the flow of, of dollars okay. and euros to come in um, is, is still okay. there and they can use those to pay for the imports. So they, if they wanted to affect the war in which every day counts, mm -hmm. think of the, the deaths and the mm -hmm. horrendous mm -hmm. uh, events there, you need to chop it very, very suddenly. And that has been the response of, of uh, many private uh, companies who see their customers mm -hmm. in the West uh, outraged at their presence in Russia, and they've withdrawn. And I think a lot of them will 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 not go back. Some will, and in the financial sphere, which is really what we're talking about, mm -hmm. something some links will be re-established, and some links will not be re-established. And one of the things that might come at the end of all this, when it comes for a settlement, okay. is those euros and dollars that are frozen and trapped of the Bank of Russia may be a convenient source of reparations to be paid by Russia for the damages caused by the war. And is there a precedent for that? Well, in the First World War, of course, there was yeah. a huge reparation. German yeah. re reparations were meant to be. They didn't pay very many of them in the end yeah. because they didn't really have the resources to do so. They had to yeah. generate export surpluses. Here is a pot of money. The yeah. total reserves are equal to about four times Ukraine's GDP. 
And I would be very surprised if they didn't form a part of the ultimate negotiations at the end of the hostilities. And is it, is it, is it um, in terms of the, the, the um, uh, I suppose if you just look out for, at, the, at the global economy generally, is this, um, you know, is what's happened now, but I suppose particularly with, 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 uh, with Ukraine and with what's happened with Russia, is that beginning to possibly see a little bit of less globalization, integration, a little bit of disintegration, do you think, that's taking place? That people be looking more closely at supply chains, looking at more closely with the people that they're doing business? Because there's a sense in which after the Berlin Wall fell and people start to invest in Russia, it was just everybody went, you know, Lashes of money flowed in both directions. Russian money eventually at a later stage coming out into the rest of the world, mm. but also a huge amount of people investing in Russia, seeing it as being part of the new order. We're all, in, you know, we're all economically integrated and 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 interconnected, and that's a good thing. Do you think that'll? Yeah, I think there's no doubt that this this is this is where where we're heading, and yeah. to to uh, probably a two block world where R Russia moves closer to China again, as it was many years ago. It was, yeah. uh, there was a fraught relationship, but it was sort of seen as a communist block. It's not a communist block anymore, but a, a block that 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 stands aloof that yeah. the West stands aloof from. And I think mm -hmm. that would be certainly the case in the financial sphere. China is, is already um, uh, rapidly uh, developing its financial system yeah. to a very sophisticated level. And they will no longer see it as necessary to be mm -hmm. so closely tied in with, with the Western dollar so system. I think we've done a lot on that probably more time. Mm. My, my time management, our time management is oh, not as good as we probably had, like had, 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 had planned. But, but, but I think it would be just good to have a short maybe discussion on the digital currency space because that's sort of the way people are talking about you know, what's going to happen to central banks, how are they going to get engaged in this process? And the other topic is, is the, the issue of you know, the role of, of central banks in relation to um, climate and the, you know, the price at which finance is available to companies who are engaging in actions which were not, are not good for the, for the, for the long-term survival of the, of the planet. So do you want to talk a little bit about just that? For, yeah. it's, it's a kind of a new role for central banks. Both, both directions are new. Really. Yeah, no, that, that's true. And, and people say, well, what about this the central bank digital currency? Why would they need that? The paper one is all right. Don't, mm -hmm. don't use it very much anymore. Just use cards. So I don't mm -hmm. see the need for, for that. Um, actually, the Chinese, we were talking about a minute ago, mm. they actually have developed the, the, the digital payment yes. system to a far greater extent than is, is yes, commonplace right, yeah. in, in Europe. Um, and they are very much very advanced in the development of a central bank digital mm -hmm. yuan, which uh, mm -hmm. is, is uh, already being you know, more than pilot, rather sophisticated de development. Uh, but it's not really that that has driven other central banks to start thinking about a, a digital currency. It was more the idea coming from Facebook, which has mm -hmm. changed its name a few mm -hmm. times since then. <laughs> um, they thought, well, let's, uh, let's bolt on a, a currency, a multi-currency right. multi uh, digital payments mm -hmm. mechanism to our existing offerings. And central banks said, well, wait a minute, we, we might, first of all, in some ill-defined way, we might lose control over the whole monetary system if yeah. a company with as many customers as That's Facebook uh, uses, uh, cr creates a new currency of its own in some way, because the, the, the proposal kept on shifting. And if it was using that in the information from the flows of payments to use that feeding into their other um, you know, business activities, so it would be a fully integrated... <laughs> and, and outside any governmental system. Or outside any, government. Any, yeah. So basically, um, central yeah. banks decided on two things. First of all, they decided if Facebook wants to do this, they've got to become a bank and got to do it through a bank. Secondly, mm -hmm. we're going to do this to make sure that, that we're not, um, we're not sidelined. So they are developing it. It'll be several years, mm -hmm. um, lots of, of unsolved problems, particularly yeah. about secrecy, uh, though mm -hmm. people seem to be quite willing to give all their information to Facebook, but... Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not to central bank. No. So but I don't see paper money and not yeah. as going away yeah. very soon. So with that, but what's the kind of time horizon on that? Is, is that sort of five, five years out? I'd say at least out? five years Central out. banks don't move very as quickly as Facebook. Well, you wouldn't like to have a You'd digital currency either. that didn't work, so you want to make yeah. sure that it yeah, absolutely, because it's uh, effects, yeah. absolutely yeah. works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is one or, uh, one or two countries, I won't mention them because of the embarrassment that they, um, they have introduced digital currencies and they haven't worked very well mm -hmm. so far. Mm -hmm. So small ones. And then just in relation the to climate. The climate change, yeah. Yeah, this has become quite a, this has been a, quite a, a big issue for central banks. Um, of course, um, carbon 
Darty industries need finance to develop their you know, mining mm -hmm. or their, you mm -hmm. know, their factories and, and so on and so forth. So could, they, could that be choked off in some way? Should it be choked off by, by financial authorities? Mm -hmm. um, some things, in my view, definitely need to be done. And the, some things are being done, mm -hmm. to a, starting to be done. Financial regulators are saying, you're not taking the risks of climate change into account. You're looking at three, four years ahead, but you're financing something that's going to last for 20, 30 years. And it's going to, you're, you, these companies that are doing, mm -hmm. dirtying the, in, the, the, destroying the climate um, are going to ra face huge costs and you're going to lose money on it. So there's a, 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 a risk argument there. Um, central, so they're, and they're requiring them to take account of those risks in their lending decisions, mm -hmm. be public about the consequences of their lending, mm -hmm. take account of the scope three emissions, mm -hmm. not, in other words, not just what you're causing yourself, but what the, your customers are causing uh, in disclosure of your activities. So people say, I don't think I like that bank. It is financing a lot of coal. Yeah. Um, central banks themselves should not be buying in their open market operations. They shouldn't be buying the bonds of, of um, heavily polluting industries. It's not clear that any of this will really have a hugely substantial mm -hmm. effect relative to the other things that governments can do mm -hmm. and need to do to solve the climate problem. And there's a risk that people might say, well, government, we don't want to do this because there's pushback when we raise prices and we raise mm -hmm. taxes mm -hmm. and so on. Maybe we can leave it to the financial sector. Finan mm -hmm. Financial sector does something, may, it may, even if it goes all out, mm -hmm. it'll probably not, uh, it will certainly not do enough mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, mitigate and, and manage the climate change problem. I mean, it's very, it, it is just, it's, it's another aspect of where the roles of central banks have sort of, at least they're, they're I say putting their noses into a number of different places, but they're looking at a number of areas that they hadn't done previously, talking mm. about things that mm. they hadn't done, you know, even things in the real economy, which historically they hadn't, it sort of stayed very, well, it's, they kind of left that to the fiscal policy and government expenditure decisions, etc. But it, it is a, this is, this is definitely a new one, and I, I hadn't thought about it until you said it, is the attraction for governments of the central bank helping them with doing some of their jobs, which would be unpopular. I, I often, when having um, known lots of central bankers, many, many of my best friends are central bankers. Mm -hmm. um, however, it seems to me uh, rather naive of uh, progressive um, activists mm -hmm. thinking we've given up on governments, Mm -hmm. We rely on the central bankers to solve the problem. This may yeah. not be a very uh, well, realistic thing to do. And of course, one of the things about it is the main instruments of, of monetary policy are less um, immediately transparent in a political sense than the ones of government. Government spends on this or doesn't spend on mm -hmm. that. It taxes this person and not that, that institution or whatever. So there's a, there's a sense in which it's, it, it's a, it can possibly get away with more than Central bankers policy. don't need fiscal to get re-elected. Uh, yeah, fiscal, yeah well, that's true. That's true. But fiscal policy is, is more is more obviously transparent yeah. in terms of how it at how how it has things. Now, Patrick, we have one question in which is in a very different direction to anything we've talked about. So I'm going to read it out to you, mm. uh, and you can decide whether or not you think it's there. I don't know whether you can see it from that distance, but let me let me uh, put on the glasses and read it out to you. It's can you talk about the effect of EC policy and monetary policy on the cost of housing? Who benefits? Why didn't <clears throat> Irish government avail of low interest rates to borrow to build social houses? Two questions there. Yeah. I certainly think um, I, I certainly think the Irish government should have been doing more to uh, build social mm -hmm. houses, and certainly uh, interest rates are low. And somebody's going to tell me, oh yes, well, there are lots of rules about about borrowing, but um, there are rules, and there are rules, and you can. Um, this this is an important priority. House prices. Will uh, have been driven up by low interest rates, mm -hmm. and they have caused uh, distributional yes. problems, not just for yes. for housing. Um, and as you know, there are other policies in, uh, available to central mm -hmm. banks, macroprudential policies, mm -hmm. loan to value ceilings, loan mm -hmm. to income, those things, which which uh, are par part of the solution of of reducing the risk associated with excessive borrowing mm -hmm. for house prices, but th they can't solve the problem of inadequate social housing and un um, unaffordable housing. That again is, tools mm -hmm. are available for government uh, to do that. It's a limited amount that, that the EC ECB uh, would, it wouldn't have a 
it yeah. wouldn't have the, in the toolbox to do it. Yeah, so it's, it's that basically over to, over to governments to do that themselves, in fact. In terms and, of, and, of course, and, and they should have, yeah. And they should have it. Um, so so um, maybe another question come in, but while maybe that's doing it, let me, let me put a, a question, at least a reflection to you, I think, that, that um, struck me over the, over, over the, over the topics. Uh, and that is the, the just relevant to this now, but that's the issue of historically low interest rates. And you showed that great chart, which, which um, showed how they've been, um, they've been coming down over the years. And what does it actually mean? to have historically low interest rates. And there's obviously going to be volatility at different stages in response to different market conditions. But, um, you know, it's that, that uh, the question that was, was raised um, uh, a couple of years ago by Thomas Piketty's book on capital in the 21st century. And he basically, you know, he said that if the rate of return on wealth is greater than the growth rate of the economy, then what's going to happen is the higher returns on capital is going to make the distribution of wealth even more unequal. I mean, one of the things that that you know, even like his, his book isn't that old, but the extent to which that discourse has moved on hugely since, and people recognising the inequality in the distribution of income, particularly within countries. I mean, I remember Robert Barrow showing how how globalisation was reducing the disparity across countries, but of course, meanwhile, within countries, there was a huge disparity, and that's to some extent linked to the to, to the interest rate. But do you think that if interest rates remain low, that'll be a, that'll have a what effect will that have? Yes, it's funny um, because. Uh, <laughs> Piketty, it's like the E equals MC squared for, yeah. for physics. Piketty thought that R greater than G, where the R mm -hmm. is the rate of interest and uh, rate of return on capital, and G is the great rate of growth of, uh, of the economy. If, it, if it's bigger, then wealthy people are getting wealthier and wealthier, yeah. uh, absorbing a, a huger uh, uh, part of the, of the pot. And you say, well, yeah, but you've been talking about interest rates being really low. So what's going on here? And I, 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 for Piketty enthusiasts, I have a chart. Right. So let's look at the last chart. Okay. And this is, um, you see, Piketty is not just talking about in interest rates on yeah. government bonds. And we yeah. were talking about short-term right. stuff and, and risk-free stuff. Yeah. But in fact, most of finance is about risk-taking stuff, equities and, and other forms of, of risk-taking investments. Mm -hmm. And this chart it purports to give you the dotted line there, dotted black line, is supposed to be the rate of return on wealth. And it goes back to 1870, and you can see, except for some uh, brief periods, more mm -hmm. or less around the time of the First and the Second World War, oh, yeah. the rate of return on wealth was great, it greatly exceeded the growth rate of the, of the economy. And still today, I think the last numbers in that there, even though it's quite a recent article, it, it, uh, they, they only run it up to 2010. But, but still the case today, the rate of return on risk-taking investment is still great. So the, the issue of growing wealth inequality is still there. In fact, mm -hmm. maybe even greater. And certainly during the pandemic, we've seen enormous increases in the concentration of wealth among billionaires. And is that, that, period, that, going, that period going down in the 70s into the, into the 80s that's there, that was the... That may be, may, that, well, that we maybe had the, the period when we all thought it was actually getting more equal, was it? Uh, well, I, uh, I think the post-war period, because mm. there, were, there were also redistributional yeah. actions by government, yes. uh, which yeah. are still available. Yeah. Um, the, the fall in the rate of return on capital was, relates to the recessions of the, of the 1970s. So, Patrick, a couple of questions have now come in. Yeah, this is, this is, this is, the, this is, we'll, 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 we'll just give a quick, quick with this. Does Patrick agree with the chief economist of the ECB, Philip Lane? That's going to be uh, our, our colleague. That currently inflationary pressures are likely to be transitory and not likely to become embedded. The Federal Reserve appears to take a different view, as do figures like Larry Summers. Um, so I'll take that one okay. First. Um, do you agree with Philip? Professor Lane is a member of the Academy. And um, <laughs> I, I think I tried to, to hint at where, where the ECB are at. Yeah. Um, they're not saying this is, this is, uh, this is uh, not a, a serious and, and um, you know, sensitive situation. They're slowing their, their purchase. They're going to stop the net, net purchases of, of the QE, the net purchase of assets. Uh, and I, they may indeed raise interest rates. But the, as I said earlier, the markets think that the in inflation rate will come down again. Yeah. And the other scholar in their board, Professor Isabel Schnabel, gave a very interesting speech in the last number of days, um, presenting all the comprehensive information and justifying, in a way, um, if, you, if you came from that market yeah. perspective. At the same time, we do know from the market that the, there is an upside risk. 
that the mm -hmm. market feels that there, that there is a risk to be compensated for. And I think everybody, including Philip, um, would, yes. would believe there is a risk, no reason to move too quickly, mm -hmm. uh, but good reason for watching very closely and collecting the data. And he's a great man for collecting the data and looking at the facts and not just saying, oh, this is like the 1970s again, it's certainly going to be a big inflation. So, so is the, is the, to what extent do you think the ECB feels um, free of what's happening um, with other, uh, with the Fed or with the Bank of England in terms of what it does? Do you think it, 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 it feels it has its own purpose and own way of dealing with this stage, that it'll do what it yeah. believes is right? It won't be a follow the leader type piece. Yeah, I mean, what, of course what the Fed does affects the environment. Yeah. But, but the, the euro is a huge uh, monetary area and a huge economy uh, with you know, 400 million people and, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it is the inflation in the euro area that it is targeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have another one in here, which is, what is your take on the modern monetary theory as promoted by David McWilliams? Are you... Ah, uh, well, David McWilliams um, And my promotes, understanding promotes is that he suggests that governments should spend their way out of any economic problem. That's how he's summarising it. Yes, well, we, we, we um, already spoke about we the did. important things the government should be spending money on. Yeah. David McWilliams is, is, I always look forward to seeing what David McWilliams is promoting in yes. any given week. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure David McWilliams will not necessarily buy into modern monetary theory this week, last week. There, there are aspects of uh, modern monetary theory... Um, the bits that I've read of it mm -hmm. um, contain many valuable sentences, but when you put them all together, <laughs> they don't, it don't, doesn't add up. <laughs> and final question that I'm going to take here is uh, from Patty Hughes. Um, what impact do you think Russia's linking of the ruble with gold and oil prices will have on currency and financial markets, particularly given that many Western currencies largely, that many Western currencies large growth in the money supply since 2008? Yeah, this is, um, <laughs> I, I think we're seeing some um, theater of the absurd in, mm -hmm. in the actions of the, some of the Russian authorities, um, President Putin pr prominent among them, who seems to think that um, perhaps his audience, I'm sure his audience is largely domestic by saying, <laughs> um, I'm only going to accept rubles in payment for, the, for natural gas exported mm -hmm. from Russia. Well, that's fine, um, <laughs> if that's what you want, and the arrangements, the details, the footnotes and the detailed arrangements are that, yes, you still deliver uh, dollars or euros to a Russian bank and they will do the conversion into rubles for you. So this is all for show to some audience that I would not have much, uh, much sympathy for. I don't, think, um, I don't think anything important is happening there. And probably an audience over which he has control. <laughs> Perhaps, yes. <laughs> so um, I think that's the end of our questions on that. Um, well, listen, Francis, I think I'd like to ask you a question. Um, we've been talking about gloomy subjects like mm. rise, increase in interest rates, increases in inflation and wars. Um, but your, your perspective is broader than the financial. <laughs> uh, what is there to be cheerful and positive about in, in April of 2022? April 2022. For a dismal economist. Well, for, uh, well, let me just take a... Um, uh, I was going to put this question to Patrick and he said I'm going to throw it back to you. So that's how <laughs> this happened. So that's why I'm aware he was going to ask it since I had raised it with him first. I mean, I, I'd just like to talk, I suppose, I, I do think uh, it is important to get perspective on, 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 um, on economies and on where we are. And one of the problems we have with, with media, naturally, they want a different story every day. And I remember speaking to... A, group of students in Trinity around the time of the financial crisis, the start of, of that. And um, they were for first and second year students, a group I went in to talk to. And I said, you know, let's do a SWOT analysis of the Irish economy at this point. You know, what, what were its strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and threats? And they were absolutely stunned because on any one day, any media piece is about the strengths we had at the time, the fact that we had, had, had you know, were, before, before the crisis came, we were in good stage with our, our debt to GDP ratio was very good. There were certain opportunities because we have the multinationals here, but any story tends to focus on one or the other. So I think it's always important to get that balance. So we've been talking about, and most what economists are, 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 are trained to do, is to identify uh, problematic issues and to focus on what can be done to improve them. So it's, it's, it's in our nature, which is why they get labeled so dismal. So I'm gonna give you just three, three pieces that struck me uh, about this. And one, I think, is um, 
the improvements in the quality of innovation in Ireland, I'm going to take Irish ones, I'm not going to take international ones, the quality of, of innovation in Ireland over the past two decades really has stunned me. And you know, we, we started back around the late 1990s in investing in R&D, in investing more in the universities, in postdocs, and in trying to underpin, we called ourselves a high-tech economy, but we weren't actually, we didn't have the underpinnings of a high-tech economy. We started there, and what I see now is that that's really coming through. Now, it's, 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 you see everybody focuses on the multinationals, but I was recently involved in, in reviewing uh, Irish companies for actually the Business and Finance Awards, and you know these people have to put proposals to talk about what they're doing, where their markets are, the challenges they're facing. It was just mind-boggling what they were doing. And these were Irish-owned smaller companies uh, that would be in under enterprise, linked to Enterprise Ireland, and then larger ones. And just what I saw was in technology terms, in, in, in market terms, what they were doing was just unimaginable at the beginning of the noughties. So that's, that's a, to me, that's a, that's a, that's a, really, a really big issue. And one of the companies, uh, actually 80% of its staff are PhDs. That wasn't a huge staff, it was under 200, but just that notion of that quality of innovation, and that wasn't there. And I think that that's something which uh, I think is, is, is important to realize it's been done. Uh, the second one, I think, is that, that um, just to talk to, the, to, to, to COVID, um, I think actually Irish employers and employees have been more agile than I would have put bets on at the beginning of COVID. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer going to work every day of the week, so uh, I, I, I don't know in detail on the ground what that actually means. But I think there has been, it has been actually quite quite good. Um, I mean, some organisations had people working from home a bit. Most of them hadn't. They were very conservative. They didn't want them working from home. Then suddenly they had to do it. And actually, they did it pretty quickly. And I think the, 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 the for, you know, while there's going to be criticisms of some of the policy interventions which weren't perfect, I think by and large the way the state went about supporting businesses and supporting individuals through the various payment systems I think worked, worked, worked quite well. Um, and, and I think one of the things we will have hopefully out of this is much less scarring in the labour market because of the connection that firms have with, with the labour force. And a lot of people who've gone back to work now post, you know, as the pandemic rolls down, have gone back to their original employers. And that basically maintains a human capital within the, in, in, the, in, the, in the enterprises and basically the connectedness of those people to, to the market. So I think that's, that's positive. Um, and just again, staying with that final one, because we're in the, we're, as we were, we're in the moment. Um, I think one of the things that, that I saw with COVID was the way in which people talked, particularly young people talked on, on Vox Pops and all these other things about altering their behavior in the interest of their parents and their grandparents. And I think there was some kind of social solidarity that, was, that came out of that. I think that was very, very positive. I think academics and health professionals really you know, got on in front of TV cameras and did things that was unimaginable 10 or 15 years ago. They wouldn't have, have, have felt the, 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 the inclination. They wouldn't have felt it their responsibility to do it. I think you know, and a lot of, of researchers and people shifted what they were doing in order to accommodate that. And I think that was, that, 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 that's a positive. I mean, if I'm, if I'm doing my kind of optimistic piece, I think as a country, we do need a discussion about, you know, we're 100 years old. We haven't looked forward about what the next 100 years means, really, partly because of the pandemic. We've been distracted by lots of other things that are around. But I think there's an opportunity, you know, whether it's using something like the Citizens' Convention, ways of actually exploring what it means in a, to be a multicultural island in, 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 in the 21st century. And I think, I, I would just think we're, we're coming out of a good period, I think, in, this, in the sense that, you know, the COVID experience was very tough, but I don't think it left the society as fractured as the financial crisis did in terms of what happened. So they would be my kind hmm. of pieces on it. And um, so it's just, it's just it's, I, was, I was going to want to hear your one, so <laughs> we, won't, we, won't, we won't hold everybody up by doing that. Uh, but I just, just want to, 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 to um, uh, just to sort of say, in, in summary, I suppose, about this, I, I still find it amazing. I often say to people, if I died in 2015, I'd have thought that I left the world in quite a decent place. But it's hard for me to believe that coming out of the financial crisis, when we just thought, we're getting out of that, we're recovering, and your charts actually show that in, in, in some of the some things that were there, we end up getting Brexit. And where this year we were, this last couple of years, we were going to be dealing with Brexit. How are we going to manage Brexit from the point of view of jobs across the country, companies affected, etc.? And the next thing we get COVID. And we're beginning finally to come out of COVID and we get the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So, I mean, these are more interesting times than I think we'd have wanted to, to live through. But, but it's, it was fantastic to hear 
in some sense, to get the perspective you had over that long period, because I think that does give us perspective. And it's not just one damn thing after another. It's not. <laughs> Even though it feels very like that just at the moment. So I'm going to hand back over to the president to close the proceedings. But thank you all for uh, listening in to us. And I hope you learned something and enjoyed something from what we talked thank about. You, well, uh, what can I add to that? Uh, uh, Francis and Patrick, that has been a totally fascinating conversation. I can imagine that you probably planned this session very differently when you first started to talk to each other about it. And then every time you wake up, as you said, it's one damn thing after another and everything is changing. Um, I think you've both um, uh, given us an amazing discourse in terms both of the topicality of the issues that you've talked about um, and, and I won't go over them all again, but clearly we could all relate to uh, every, everything that you've raised. I, I'm very glad that Francis was able at the end to frame it in some more positive way because it has been one thing after another. And you have both uh, brought your tremendous learning and scholarship to the uh, economic and political analysis of the events that have bedeviled us uh, over the last uh, four or five years. So I would like to thank you both very much for that wonderful conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Mason, Hayes and Curran for their support and uh, Mary O'Dowd, the Secretary of the Academy who organizes this discourse program. The next discourse for the Academy will be on the future of higher education, which obviously will have to respond in many ways to the issues that, that were talked about tonight. Um, that discourse is going to be um, between Sir Adrian Smith, who is the president of the Royal Society in London, and he's coming here to have a conversation with Professor Orla Feely, uh, Vice President for Research, Innovation and Impact in UCD. This also will be a fascinating conversation and it will take place online on Thursday the 28th of April at 6 p.m. And further information on booking details are available on the Royal Irish Academy website and that is www.ria.ie and I hope you will be able to join us then. And in the meantime, stay safe and good evening and thank you again to Francis and Patrick. Thank you.